Hey gang, thanks for joining us for another episode of the Radults Podcast. This episode we are joined by musician extraordinaire Josh Collard. You may know him from the band Earthcaller. If not, remedy that quick and give them a spin. Josh, welcome to Radults. Who are you? What do you do? Uh, my name is Josh Collard. <laughs> uh, I am a uh, songwriter, producer and frontman of a metal band called Earthcaller. How did you get into being in a band? You've been in other bands or performed with bands. How did you get into that? Oh yeah, I've been in. Uh, I've been personally in like so many bands over time. Um, when I was uh, when I was fourteen, I picked up guitar for the first time. Um, <clears throat> I uh, was told by my teacher that I had like a pretty uh, distinct like natural talent for it, and within a year, I had started uh, an emo band. <laughs> um, and yeah, ever since then I haven't really looked back. Like it's been like the the great passion of my life. We need to know the emo band name. We do. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Are you sure? Do you yeah. really? Okay. Yeah, Juliet Sand. That I is like so it. emo. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it's perfect. I can time. I can picture the time and place as well because of the fact you've yeah. gone and you've gone with a reference to what I'm assuming is the Hollywood version of Romeo and Juliet as yes, well, yeah. which places me within the imagery so perfectly I can see what that band sounded like yeah. looks like everything um, we even had a song called Buried in Verona like we went we went deep on the Romeo and Juliet shit man like was... I wonder if that was the influence behind the band Buried in Verona uh, oh well yeah true maybe I want to know if you're wearing like a Hawaiian shirt during this time like Baz Luhrmann you know like you have to do the Hawaiian shirts and the chinos Nah, man, I reckon I was wearing Sayosin shirts that were, like, two sizes too small for me. Something like that. <laughs> cool. That was everyone. So how do you go from Juliet's End to Earthcaller? What's the, uh, the, what's the process the involved timeline. there, the timeline? Okay, so, uh, so Juliet's End I did until I was about um, 16. Uh, we, we, we did quite well. Like we were playing like, uh, we were playing like local freezer shows to like 300, 400 people sometimes. Yeah, like we were headlining them. Our last ever show was our first ever overage show, which was a bang in the city. <laughs> and like, that's where we decided to crescendo. And, uh, so after that I was in a metal band called Meridian, which also did pretty good. Like Crafter and, um, Tommy Dollars and stuff would come to our shows. <laughs> That's and sick. Yeah, we even got like offered a tour once that the guys, because we were super young, we got offered a tour once that we couldn't do because we were so young. Yeah. Like, um, and then, uh, <clears throat> and then, sorry, excuse me. Um, yeah, uh, and then after that, uh, I played in another band called uh, Thunder Child with some members of uh, with some members of Juliet's End and some new ones and like we, we did that also did pretty good but it didn't last for a long time uh, we played like a bunch of gigs with like Closure in Moscow and the Getaway Plan and stuff like that it was like that kind of music so yeah I went back to back to emo for a little bit <laughs> and then yeah after that I uh, oh no I was in a band called Collapse my first yeah. like hardcore hardcore band cool and um and then I took a couple of years off to uh, be a scumbag for a while, and um, <laughs> I think like if anybody's if anybody's heard of Earthcaller and knows about me, then they'll probably know what that means. <laughs> and, um, uh, and um and then after that short sabbatical, like uh, I played in Closure in Moscow, and then uh, after my time in Closure in Moscow, I started Earthcaller. Brilliant. Yeah, so that's um, been my journey. That's quite the the wave of uh, of different genres and delineations. And yeah. um, playing with Closure would have been an entirely different experience to any of the other bands you've yeah, been was, involved in. It was um, awesome. The technical proficiency <laughs> levels well, yeah, through I, the roof. I played bass in that band. Like I've never played bass in a band before, and like that wasn't just like a you know like a. A hardcore band playing bass in a hardcore band where you're the third best guitarist. In yeah, <laughs> it's, it's like it was actual bass, and like you know they're like they're like sticklers. Like Barrett runs a tight ship. You know? Yeah. Did you find that the process of stepping back from the mic and being being the bassist in a band actually helped you become better oh, as one, a frontman at all? One hundred percent, man. One hundred percent, because. Um, 
Well, I would say like uh, with with the except literally with the exception of Earth Caller and that metal band that I was in when I was like uh, like really young called Meridian. All of my other bands have been either like guitar or bass and stuff like that, and and I really do believe that uh, my time spent not on the mic uh, sort of enhanced what I was able to do on the mic because like I uh, um, I was like very conscious of of when it's time to like let the guitar shine, uh, how to stay how to stay out of the way of other members on stage while still being able to command the whole crowd or whatever, um, and um, and just um, I guess just like not falling into like those classic pitfalls that singers fall into with like the ego and all that kind of shit. A lot of people in bands get like sort of like lost in their own like up their own ass kind of and. Yeah. Um, and what a lot of people don't realize is that when people go to see a show, they didn't go to see you play the fuck out of your guitar. They didn't go to see you play the fuck out of your drum kit or sing as hard as you can. They went to see five people playing together perfectly, not trying to overshadow each other. Like, and that's what I think delivers like the best show. I've seen how you move on stage more than once, and that's the the thing that. You guys are all like sort of in sync with each other when you're on stage. You can see that you all know obviously when parts coming up, you know where to go, and so that you're in position when that happens. You know, you know like when like if punk jumps are gonna happen when, yeah. and then like just go like all right, move out of the fuck away, this yeah. sort of thing, and then you know, and then also that I know when to that. protect my face, when to protect my balls. <laughs> yeah, <you> well, know? <laughs> and at the same time, you you have that strut on stage too, and yet you're not in the way of anyone. Like you, you're probably one of the the most like active people like on stage that I've seen in forever. Yeah, thank you for saying that. <laughs> it's actually trippy because I'm definitely one of the fattest vocalists in the world. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not touching that one. Podca- um, I need to remind you that podcasting is not a visual realm. Yeah. <laughs> no one knows if that's true or not. So yeah, just describe how fat I am. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna use Earth Caller, the sort of template for yeah, it. Yeah, Obviously, since you've got such a history with bands, but what were your influences? both musical and I guess obviously like lifestyle that are then put into Earthcore. Okay, so mu- musically, um, when I first started Earthcaller, so so I guess just like the general, like overall sort of ethos of Earthcaller was I want to make music that helps people. Yeah. Cool. And um, I've explored that in like really different ways. Like, uh, so the first record was I wanted to help people in the way of like sort of like unearthing like some political stuff or helping people sort of find their place in the world like through their belief structure and stuff. Like that was, I guess, what I was trying to do there. I thought that that would be something that I would like stick with for like the entire uh, course of the band. But um, after that record, like I grew as a musician, grew as a person, like. Um, and then uh, with Crystal Death, I thought to myself, like, well, maybe I can help people. Uh, maybe I can help people with um, sort of putting themselves back together emotionally, because that was something I had to do. Um, I had to do myself. Like in the early stages of Earthcaller, like I ignored a lot of my own, like uh, a lot of my own sadness, a lot of my own anger, a lot of my own like internal fucked upness. But because like there was just the overall goal, like I had to get this going. Like you know, I had to had to kick these goals. I had to get to this place. And then when I got to the place, I was I sort of realized that like while it was awesome to like finally be here, have like something of my own that like I uh, you know well be proud of you know like I felt as though uh, it was almost impossible to fully enjoy it without taking care of who I was inside like smoothing out the rough edges and stuff and then I decided to do that with Crystal Death and uh, moving and so like that's like our latest release today moving forward I've got some like even newer ideas of how I'd like to help people through music so do you think that like outside of it helping yourself do you find that I guess the goal is to just continue helping people but at the same time like you're growing as that person oh yeah totally man it's like the most cathartic thing ever and I know that the que- the question was was what bands to bring it back to the question yeah. um, the bands that helped me throughout my life you guys are both wearing t-shirts <laughs> of Bad Religion Comeback Kid Comeback Kid in a metaphorical help me out and literal sense like I'm friends with Andrew and he um, like he has literally helped me out a lot <laughs> in life. <laughs> Other bands like emotionally, like older bands like Silverstein and Funeral for a Friend, all that kind of good stuff. 
with Earthcall, uh, melodically there's stuff from like punk and emo, uh, heavy wise there's stuff from like, you know, Slipknot and um, like big breakdown bands like I Killed the Prom Queen and Parkway and all, all that kind of stuff. Like lyrically through like punk and again emo and stuff. But also like there's just been this like big overtone of like rap throughout the whole thing. Like it's got like a little bit of a rap vibe as well. Like I wanted to be like a, a Rage Against the Machine for like for emo kids. Basically. Cool. Yeah. When you're speaking about the cathartic aspect of um, of the writing process for yourself with Earthcaller, have you found that there's great power in that process and that you've become a better human being as a result of having committed to doing that process? And that's something that more people should consider doing themselves. Yeah, definitely, man. Definitely. Like that. Uh, actually, I'm like multiple sort of layers so like the initial layer that it uh that you can like help yourself and you know in a sense empower yourself is the fact that you uh allow yourself to be vulnerable with yourself and write those things down and then be able to read them without fucking crunching up the paper and throwing it out the window or some shit like that so there's that and so like you express yourself and then that lifts the weight off you and then you're able to read it and process it and then that makes you feel uh more comfortable in the fact that you, you are to whatever extent an artist and so like it helps you in that aspect but then you put it out and other people hear it and then uh, other people enjoy it and so like it, it makes you feel like you know like you you're doing something you like you know you're part of something bigger than yourself at that point and then um, you know things like um, like at one show in Brisbane this is like a night that sticks out for me uh, two separate people come up to me. One person said that they heard Shadow Dance and uh, because of that song, the lyrics on it, they didn't kill themselves. Um, they were suicidal. And another person, um, another uh, another person, like really sick. Like, you know, like to the point where they were in and out of hospital, was, yeah. they were probably going to die. Said that like, like Degenerate was like a great comfort to her in her, that time where she was sick to the point where like, nurses would like play certain songs from it for her like when they were going through some like hard stuff together like when you hear that like somebody was gonna die until they heard your record or that somebody used their record used your record to like help them get through uh, a period where their life was literally in danger as well like it gives songwriting like a whole new meaning and then moving forward from there, like I was able to take into account like, okay, like some people, are, there are some people out there that are going to hear these songs and it's going to be that important to them. So like then when you're going into writing the songs, you like treat it even more with like the process with like reverence almost. Your enemy will always be like one of my gym jams. It will always mm. be not gym jams as in like pajamas, but like no, gym yeah. jams. Jimmy jams. I get what you mean. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Hi, my name's Josh. I write Jimmy jams. <laughs> he does. But it's always like, I've never been, let's say, wronged by the police myself, but if anything, like, that energised me and made me focus on going, like, all right, well, it does happen, and it's okay to keep an eye out for that and know that it does happen. Just because they're in that position of power doesn't mean that they're right as well. You know, it's not that all of them are, like, corrupt or all that are bad and stuff like that, but it does happen, like, in any other sort of role. And no, it's 100%, like, man. You know, there's, like, in anything, there's good people, there's bad people... And just because you have that position of power doesn't mean that you can do what you do. Yeah, 100%. And, like, um, since I wrote that song, like, I, I'm pretty sure I wrote that song at, like, the end of 2013 for it to come out sometime in 2014. My, uh, my opinion of just the world in general has evolved since then. And, um, you know, like, I was obviously very hardline, like, anti-police uh, at that point in my life. But some time goes by you behave like less of a criminal and you notice that the police really aren't like the police really aren't coming after you that much you know <laughs> and um and uh and then it just sort of changes when i when i think about the song your enemy and when i'm performing it like where i get my energy from is that i think of it less of a of, as a song about anti-police and more of it as a song about anti-injustice yeah yep. and there's plenty of that in the world like and it obviously sucks us obviously the meaning has changed and varied for you but there's still a meaning to you yeah it's just shifted from one thing to another and like more encapsulated more than one thing yeah the world's not as black and white as i thought it was like that's like um that's like a message that i'd like to send to anybody in their like early 20s like or like even younger the world isn't as black and white as you think it is and like what I've found 
now that I'm like, you know, well, I won't be in my 20s for like much longer. Like is that, I guess what I've found is that when you do actually know what the fuck's going on, you know that you have no idea what the fuck's going on. Like that's what, that's what it is. That's what knowing what the fuck's going on is. <laughs> knowing that you have no idea. The world's not as against you as you make it out no. to be, or like you think it is. At that well, point. if you position yourself as against the world, then it's going to be against, against you. you. Yeah. Yeah. yeah uh, that's you share a, a viewpoint with Jenna from Tonight Alive oh, in really? that regard. Yeah. <laughs> Which is quite interesting. Tired. Yeah. 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 She, yeah. She's been an amazing friend. She's cool. What do you think the rightest thing you've done? So like far musically, is like, musically or in your life, either way. Okay, so like in my life, this one time I did a nose grab transfer. That was sick. Um, <laughs> <laughs> On Tony Hawk Pro Skater too. <laughs> no, 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 RL, RL nose grab. no, no. But the raddest, the raddest thing I've done in music. Um, hang on, let me think about this. I should put like elevator music in this part. <laughs> um, no, the. I reckon the raddest thing I've ever done is, um, musically is, uh, it's got to be times where I've performed with people that I really admire. Like, uh, for, like, Andrew. One, yeah, that one that sick. sticks out to, thank you. Um, like, uh, I got to sing, like, uh, yeah, I got to sing, uh, it was all in a year. All in a year, that's My right. favorite comeback kid song. Oh, yeah, that's, that's, the, <laughs> that's the quintessential one. Yeah. Andrew, wait, just before that, Andrew actually caught me, like, going over the lyrics, like, <laughs> on the phone. And he's just like, what the fuck? <laughs> like, he's just like, you don't know the lyrics? <laughs> I was just like, pretty much, no way. <laughs> like, for those of you who don't know, that was an excellent Andrew impersonation. Uh, you. <laughs> you don't know the lyrics? What the fuck? Like, it's not as easy as Wake the Dead, right? <laughs> no. Yeah, also, I, I would consider that to be the raddest thing you've done, too, judging by <laughs> that story. It was crazy cool. Like, that was amazing. Like, it was good to see. I was, I was stoked for that. Well, all right, so we have a tradition here on Radults that we like to take a few moments to step out of the in-depth conversation we're having with our guest to celebrate some of the more ridiculous elements of existence. Um, in this particular instance, we're going to venture into the realm of Frankenstein. Okay. In a way. So this is called a rad break. And today's rad break is going to feature... Frankenstein. <laughs> uh, so pretty much the question that we've got for you in this rad break okay. is if you could ge genetically engineer the perfect vocalist, who would it consist of oh, and why? Oh, that's a good question. That is a cool question. Okay. The perfect vocalist. Well, I don't know, man. Like, that's actually a hard question because there are some vocalists out there that you need not genetically engineer. They're already <laughs> fucking there, man. Like, um, <laughs> but the, the perfect vocalist to me would be, I guess, somebody that's able to, like, obviously, like, wail the fuck out of, like, you know, he just hit it hard. So I guess, like, in that... In that aspect, like you'd go, your Sam Carter's, your Andrew from Comeback Kids, like those are the guys that can like hit that like top level of energy oh. and just be perfect every time. So and they like, can hold it. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Hold Sam it. Carter's uh, top end pitch scream is insane. Oh yeah, I was standing side stage once and I watched Architects. I asked their sound guy, like I was just like, is this all him or is there any help? And he's just like, no help. This is one hundred percent him. Like, and I was just like. Reverbs up yeah. as high as it will so, go. Yeah, yeah. So we're starting with the wailing ability yeah. of uh, of Andrew and Sam. Yeah, that's what you want up there. Yep. And then so for, um, <laughs> in terms of like, so like the next thing I'd go with is like uh, like taste, like tastefulness and stuff like that in terms of like uh, vocals. So like you'd want to go like with that, like you'd say you'd probably want to go like some somebody more mainstream, you know, like like I guess like Dave Grohl, something like that, like cool. that, because he can he can write that like. It doesn't sound like it's a mainstream song when he sings it, but it is. You yeah. know, it is like that pop appeal, but he does it in such like a cool, unfaultable way. Yeah, he has an everyman rock voice. <clears throat> like you can, you could have your average tradie singing along to it just oh, fine, yeah, yeah. just as well as you could have like a world class vocalist sing along to it. It's yeah. a skill, an ability to convey emotion and and, and a, a a lyric in that way mm. that's so in, instantly relatable to a large number of people. Yeah, is a genuine skill. And yeah. He's got like the meaty, like the meanest radio friendly hooks. Yeah, like, yeah. as well. Like you can go, all right, that song. You put Monkey Wrench on the radio, <laughs> and people would be fine with it. Go, okay, I can sing along to this. Sam, Andrew, Dave. Okay, so so my next like point that I would like consider in trying to like genetically engineer a um a perfect vocalist is like um 
is rhythmic ability. And so from there, like you probably want to go like a rapper, like, yeah. you know, to, to get that, like, to get that like percussive aspect to vocals. So I'd maybe say either Biggie or Big Pun yeah. there. So like you want, you want that. And then the next aspect, I would say somebody who's able to like slide into like some mellow stuff. So like if we could get if like honestly I would probably actually pick Jenna from Tonight Alive like she she like you know like her bridge breaks that yeah. she does where it's just like like maybe like some synth in her and like you know you just kind of want to cry when you listen to it <laughs> uh, her and I was actually listening do you guys remember like Mazzy Star from the nineties yes yeah, yeah 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 her so a fusion of her and Jenna within that one place and then I guess finally you'd you'd want a you'd want to pick somebody for like charisma of live and stuff like that so maybe go somebody like um i don't know maybe like ollie sykes like he's yeah. quite he's quite a commanding presence on stage like oh no oh and uh and winston for like yeah banter i love what he says between songs it chase me up peeps <laughs> completely that is a monster of a vocalist know, you've created <laughs> hopefully someone can step forward with all of those characteristics and yeah. just make us all redundant <laughs> <laughs> I look forward to their record. Yeah. Speaking of records, Crystal Death fucking rules. Thank you. You're allowed to swear on this podcast, by the way. I did, so that's the new rule. Uh, <laughs> it's a rule, and I actually feel like feel cool no, you when have I do to it. Swear. So I, I edit and do all the production side of this, and I love being able to press that explicit tag on it. Yeah, yeah. And I'm yeah. uploading it. I'm like, yeah, I'm a badass. Like, I'm pressing this button. Yeah, look at all those colors records. You thing. go down, it's like explicit. Yeah. yeah. So as soon as like, I'm just like. Fuck. And then I'll get to press it. Yeah. So. We all had that t-shirt when we were kids that said, warning, parental guidance recommended. Yeah, yeah. Right. Explicit language. My L- point is... Limp Biscuit Riffs. Yeah, Limp Biscuit Riffs. <laughs> My point with the uh, Crystal Death thing is, you've already touched on this a little bit, but I think it would be remiss of us not to address the record and its themes in a more in-depth manner no, on this podcast, because there is an, a great amount of power in what you've presented. Oh, thanks. You. And... I think it's a conversation worth having. So, if you don't mind, I might let Mike lead the conversation on this. Well, let's kick it. One of the things that I want to know is how did you manage to keep the earth caller sound that everyone knows, like from Degenerate, bring it over to Crystal Death, but at the same time sort of like shift it, bring in new like inputs and new obviously like artistic sort of deviations mm. bringing in people like Sophie and Taylor and stuff like that to do stuff and more going to like almost like sort of like dark mannerisms where for some you could say that Degenerate was more straight up just like OG metalcore yeah, sort yeah. of stuff and then bring it where you've still got all those same elements but you've brought in more and put it in but made it that it's not overdone Okay. Either. So, um, like, that's a cool question, by the way, because, like, it, it, it was something that I consciously aimed for. So, the way that I generally, as, like, a songwriter, especially with, like, my, my bands and so, like, now it's a little bit different because I'm writing for so many things. Like, I write for some other artists, but, like, with Earthcaller, I consciously aim to provide our fan base with what they know and love, but also um, experiment enough so that, that, that maybe I can surprise them and give them something else that they like that they weren't expecting to see. The way that I sort of go about that is, is that once an album is done, I try my best not to not stop writing. So like, I'm still in a familiar realm of like headspace from while I'm writing the album and that sort of continues on, but also continue forward with the conscious idea of I need to be pushing this like I need to be pushing this further and I actually got the idea from it for, for doing things like that from uh, listening to comedians because comedians uh, what they do, like I've heard a bunch of them just say they take the they take the best joke that they have from their last record and then they write from there and that's what I tried to do with um, Earth Call so like in my opinion like from Degenerate, the best song on there was like uh, either Your Enemy or Exile Exist. That's yeah. m- my opinion. And um, I just sort of went from there. And so like, and yeah, and, the, and Crystal Death was the result. And uh, for the next stuff, like I've done the, done like the same thing. So you'll get the Earthcaller that you know and love, uh, the progression of Earthcaller that came about in Crystal Death and then some new shit too. What was your sort of headspace and also what were you listening to at the time of Crystal Death that, you know, you're putting in like those, you know, like the melodic synths in it, you let it be more ambient. You weren't afraid of 
not so much silence, but just like stillness in songs as well. Yeah. So when I was writing Degenerate, I was listening to a lot of heavy music. Yeah. Like that was what I was sort of just listening to at the time. This time I was listening to like almost no heavy music aside from like um, old favorites and my friends. Yeah. Because um, I always like to, you know, obviously support other heavy bands. Like, I'll always check it out, know, know what's going on in the scene, know what people are digging, know what people aren't digging. I was more listening to hip-hop, rock. That's how I... Th- that's, that was my sort of, like, um, I guess, tactic on how I was going to push the band and the genre by listening to other genres and seeing what I could incorporate into it. And... Um, and as you were talking about, like, those those really melodic, synthy parts, like, that obviously doesn't generally come from metal that comes more from pop music and yeah. and like uh, R&B and all that kind of stuff and like uh, and yeah that's where it, that's where it came from I just backhanded the microphone <laughs> you literally just pimp slapped that mic yeah <laughs> when you're recording writing for the next album do you listen to your like back catalogue of like Earth Call of stuff or do you try and stay away from it it's impossible to stay away from because we're touring and playing the songs yeah. so much, but um, that also means that I don't need to really listen to it to have a frame of reference. Like, yeah. I know exactly what we're doing, but I just always just try and think about what what were the real successes in the previous record and just work from there. Like, use that as the foundation for what the next one is. You mentioned that you have friends in bands and that you mm-hmm. listen to those. I guess now's a good time to sort of give a shout out to some of the bands that you're listening to at the moment that you're enjoying and oh, yeah, stuff like yeah. that. I'll just start off by saying this. Uh, Australian heavy music, I don't care what anybody says, it is the gold fucking standard at the moment. Right now, even our medium and low tier bands are like still better than some of the fucking top tier bands from other places in the world. So with that in mind, I'd like to give a shout out to... Uh, Dreg uh, New Blacklist Amazing You guys heard that band Whatever Forever? Yes Dude That fucking like Cool little video With the, the It was just The yeah. cameraman was just Spinning around Watching them and they could, That band has like Three front men in it Somehow <laughs> Like what? Yeah like, I somehow missed this band Okay yeah. so like I think the drummer sings The guitar sings And the singer sings Yeah And like All of them Individually Could be Captivating enough Front men like if they were in def- different bands, but they're all together, so it's just like super good. Um, Wither, featuring an ex-member of Earthcaller. Their new record's great. Bellhaven, which has the same singer. Awesome. Alpha, fuck me. Like, <laughs> sorry, I could do this all day. Alpha Wolf. Yeah, like their new shit's amazing. Justice for the Damn just released that new song, and Justice for the Goddamn. It's good. Oh, New Hellions. Yeah, yeah, that's 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 my shit right now. Before we get back on track, and I'll let Brenton take over then, what's your record of 2018? I don't know if I've got one off the top of my head now. Um, <laughs> Look, I'll be generous, you can have three. Three? Okay. I'm always a sucker for Parkway Drive. Like, they can literally do no wrong by me. Like, they I can't. agree, that completely. That was a tight yeah. album, too. Amazing, yeah. It deserved the aria. And probably deserved longer than six seconds on TV. Like, let's, uh, let's be honest. Yeah. Yeah. Mate, Brenton mate. has too much of an opinion on this. <laughs> Wait, did uh, you know Wall of Sound? <laughs> yes. Um, so he did a post about it, and I wrote, like, three paragraphs in the comments <laughs> section. Like, I got pretty fucking cheap up about that. And, um, but, yeah, so it sounds like we're all on the same page. I think Brenton was going to riot. Like... <laughs> <laughs> One man, right? Oh, no, there would have been more. Like, I mean, Shepherd, really? Yeah. Like, like, <laughs> don't they have that one song? Uh, and it's like Toto's Africa, pretty much. <laughs> uh, so, so yeah, that new Parkway. Wait, I'm just trying to think of what, what else has come out, like, this year. Um, oh, New Hallians is awesome. Yep. I don't know. Oi, you know what? Spotify has kind of fucked up my, my, Your... my process of, like, new music. Because, yeah. like, I'll be like listening to some shit on Spotify came out in 2014 I'm taking it as new and like rather than like listening to whole albums I'll like know like three songs off them it's kind of actually fucking with my head but yeah I'll put Parkway at the top of that cool that's an interesting point you've just made that we may as well talk about because it's raised its head the way that Spotify and streaming services in general distribute music is more so intended to be on a single by single basis as opposed to a record basis does that impact the way that you approach writing music Uh, it has now it has now like um, uh, specifically for this um, yeah I'll I'll just talk about it we've got some new stuff coming out pretty soon 
my process is different. Like I, I've questioned, I've questioned things that I've never thought that I would ever question. For example, like um, is the best way is the best vessel for which your music to be released a full album you know or 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 do i do two eps or do i just release singles single 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 like and so like these are questions that i'm still asking myself right now and that's because of spotify now another thing is is like for the way the spotify monetary structure works out like you know you've got you've got people like Dr- sorry excuse me drake and kanye west who uh they have teams of people that have decoded Spotify's algorithms and they basically like feed them information as to what kind of songs they should write. Now, like the, the result of that, from what I understand, is like you'll find a Kanye West album has like a bunch of songs that go for like a minute 50. And yep. like, and so like, um, like, you know, they're taking into account things like the average attention span of people, like how long of a song that they're actually listening to and the percentage for which of a song you have to listen to for it to count as a stream on Spotify, all that kind of stuff. And so like, oh, and like, like so, so like, it definitely does take into account. Um, and another thing that it takes into account is, is um, even to the point where uh, promoters and no longer entirely looking at like past ticket sales on whether or not they want to book your band they'll go how many monthly listeners on Spotify yeah. and you'll find that like some like weird lineup changes like or like you know some weird progression in the way lineups are built uh, is based on Spotify so like the power of that machine is infinite so yeah if you listen to this get onto Crystal Death Go to sleep, have it on repeat on Spotify, <laughs> Hell yeah. and do local music a favor. And not only will you do local music a favor, you'll do yourself a favor because you will learn a lot about the power of catharsis through music, okay. which is one thing that I I really do want to get back to quickly before we take our our detour into what's next in your life. Okay. Um, is you made a conscious decision to write about your your issues from the past, yeah, yeah, but not in a direct way. Yeah. So in a way that would be relatable to others mm. while still dealing with the, the internal turmoil that you you would dealt with. Yeah. Um, how important to you was making sure that you got that message across versus making sure that the tunes were the way they were as well? So it's the sonic and lyrical elements, I suppose, the importance of them. Well, there's... They like they they actually kind of went hand in hand. Like you know, the fact that I wanted to write about these sort of like sadder issues and stuff sort of influenced the music and being like, well, they they needed to be the songs themselves needed to be like um, fitting to be able to carry those sorts of lyrics. And so you know, like you've mentioned before, like you'll find those bits where it's like right dulled down, like or not dulled down, but like you know, just the music gets brought right down with like a synth part and some singing, like. You know, like those are because of the lyrical things, and um, I feel as though I feel as though they kind of like went hand in hand and actually sort of piggybacked off each other and made them both better. You know, in terms of in terms of like that the lyrical construct, like the main reason for for choosing that subject and like going balls deep in it was because I honestly felt like I couldn't go on, on in life until I like redre- addressed all of that cool. stuff. And like, there's a lot of people out there that I know like really like our music, really like. Like, they've told me that they have respect for me and, like, respect for what I do and respect for my honesty and stuff like that. And, like, I I thought that I would be selling all of those people short if I didn't be my full honest self and didn't bear myself like that. And most of all, selling myself short. And honestly, like, since I wrote that album, since I've released it, like, I've had, like, just so much positive feedback and, like, so so many, like watching people, like, fucking throw throw down hard ass to, to those songs and, like, having people come up to me saying how much the album means to them, telling me that they cry while listening to it and shit like that. Like, you know, it's allowed me to, like, move on from that part of my right. life. Like, it's out there now, and now I'm, like... Yeah, now I'm just in this, like, even more different place than Degenerate to where I started. Like, you know, it's just... Being in a band so weird, man. Like, yeah, like, <laughs> yeah it's just the way it makes you grow. In a way, it sort of makes it almost like a photo album and like a timeline for Fucking you. Fucking earth, exactly, bro. You yeah. could go back and like you'll remember what sort of headspace and what sort of place you were as a person. You know, when Degenerate came out, the same with Crystal Death and then whatever comes from that. Um, that you can go back and go, yep, yeah, cool, I remember vividly what happened there, what happened there, yeah. what, and stuff like that, and look back at it and obviously go back and 
notice the growth as well. Yeah. Let's have a chat about the future. Sure. Okay. Uh, My favorite. Yeah, the, it's the best, right? Yeah. It's always yes. what's coming next. <laughs> yeah. So. In 2050, uh, <laughs> when robot kind has taken over the world and men are all but ashes. What do you think heavy music will sound like? <laughs> Actually, genuinely answer that question. That's, in two, that's a fun in question. 2050, yeah, uh, it will either be just like it will either be literally sounds that make your asshole bleed, or it'll <laughs> or it won't exist. At or all. it'll be the sixth wave of new metal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> new metal sixth wave. <laughs> well, we're on the second wave now, right? Or the third wave. Third wave of new metal is now. Yeah. Um, with the intro- with the um, the injection of it into stuff like Blacklist and uh, Ocean Grove and um, yeah. and stuff like that. Um, drag. Drag. Yeah. <laughs> Would yeah. you guys say that there's those elements in Earthcaller? Because definitely, like, I yeah. Think so. yeah, yeah. I mean, not so much like Wayne Static, Static X, <laughs> but, oh, yeah, yeah. but yeah, like the Limp Biscuit, yeah, you know, like the Corn sort of yeah. elements, like almost like the rap metal sort of. Oh, there is a song on the new stuff where I actually just rap. That's yeah. it. Cool. Yeah. yeah. So music is music is cyclical. The the trends are cyclical. What yeah. about the future for Josh Collard and for Earthcaller? What's coming up that excites you? Uh, we're currently in the process of writing, recording new stuff. Um, we've had some like uh, we've had some like pretty boss ass lineup changes. Um, you know, obviously brought on by like sad things such as like um, our drummer Joel uh, getting sick. Um, I don't know how much he would like me to talk about. I mean, going to like whatever you're comfortable with it. You know? Yeah, like, but more or less, that guy is a fantastic drummer, fantastic guy. Um, we had like a lot of fun touring together, and um, and. When he came to me, told me that basically, like he, he had a sickness that was uh, making him in the middle of sets when I fucking vomit and and like effectively rendering him unable to play the drums to his full capacity, which is something he was born to do. You know, just be an absolute machine. Um, it was super sad, but it uh, and uh, but it allowed for like it allowed for like this new era of Earth Caller to sort of begin like there's some new people in the band and it's sort of changed like rather than me r- entirely running the show and and um being like the the driving force like I've, I've got these new people which everybody will like will be announcing very soon so I keep an eye out for that but um I've got these new people that have like uh that for the first time are like really making everything easy for me they're like what don't you like doing this isn't this what do you like doing this isn't this okay that's all you have to do we got the rest and it's like it's really fucking tight man so um so since that lineup change has happened so this is all behind the scenes sort of stuff yeah. like by the time this podcast will come out that probably uh will be announced and stuff so i'd just like to uh, i'm just taking this opportunity to give these boys like a little bit of a g up like you know i want them to know how much i appreciate them um what's ended up happening is like they've taken jobs that uh i can do but i'm not the greatest at off my hands which has taken like a significant amount of stress off my hands and since then funnily enough um I've done some writing and the writing having not been sort of convoluted by all of the extra back behind the scenes shit that I have to do the songs are like the songs are like exponentially better than they were before like the less pressure that's on me, the the more I can deliver, and it's it's been like really awesome. Um, so so yeah, two thousand and two thousand and nineteen is a, is a year of new beginnings and new uh and new ventures. It's a year of the earth doggies. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I expect these songs in my um, inbox, by the way. Oh yeah yeah yeah. No, you got it. There's two I can there's two I can send you today. We've talked about what's next for you. It seems like it's an exciting year coming up, which is stoked. That's got me stoked. We're going to wrap this up awesome. with two things. The first one being, what are your tips for being a rat My tips for being a rat Okay, my, tip, my, my number one tip for being a, a rat is to remember that when you were a kid and you looked at people that were in the rat race and you, you thought to yourself, like, Jesus Christ, I don't ever want to fucking be like that. Just remember that thought. Remember that thought and remember the intensity to which that you didn't want to have that happen to you. And use that as the primary driving force to push you in the direction of embracing your creative aspect and knowing that there's a lot of examples of people exploring their creativity and finding a financial 
financially stable life from that. And like ultimately, that's what you really want. Like you don't you don't need to worry about being like the biggest fucking band in the world or the biggest uh, artist in the world or the biggest whatever in the world. All you need to do is just get yourself to a place where you can fucking buy your missus some lunch, you know, <laughs> pay for rent, like that kind of thing. And yeah, and in that pursuit, you will find yourself being a fucking rat up because you're not you're not like stressed out or bummed out like other like other adults. Like you know, you've still got that like youthful zest within you. And so like that's my tip. The very last thing before we say bye and hug it out is plug your stuff, where we can find you, where listeners can find you. Okay, um, so you can find us on all major platforms such as uh, YouTube, Spotify, Deezer. Um, anything that I'm missing there? Probably iTunes. iTunes, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Apple Music. <laughs> yeah, Apple, wait, actually, actually, Apple Music. Um, actually, Apple Music were like really good to us. They put us on like the A1 metal playlist, uh, one sick. of our songs, and that song on that playlist got like got insane views like more than we have on Spotify but um but yeah uh, so you can find it there if you want physical shit you can go uh, online JB Hi-Fi you can go uh, into a JB Hi-Fi and buy our record and um, I'm pretty sure it's also at Sanity oh yeah and 2400 for our merch Sick. and um, for our merch and records and for social media for social media uh, yeah just facebook.com slash earthcaller uh, Instagram uh, our Instagram is at earthcaller um, my personal one is at Josh DTD and uh, Twitter is I'm pretty sure it's twitter.com slash earth underscore caller it's come that time where we say thanks to Josh for coming in Thank and you. being on Radults Thank we've you. definitely decided that you're a certified Radult yeah thanks again and have a rad day yeah thanks man <laughs> cheers